All right, Piero Masturbino, thank you for joining me today. Really appreciate you spending some time with us. Um, I wanted to just get a little bit of a history uh, of, of your winery, your family, because you guys have um, really been an integral part of the wine development and and really the the the, the region as a whole in in Campania. So, if you could tell me just a little bit about you know your winery and your region, Campania specifically, and its history. Yes, Campania uh, region is uh, an historic uh, region for uh, wine culture and for viticulture in general, because it was uh, the uh, place where we had the two main roots of uh, European uh, uh, wine culture. One was Latin and the second was Greek. And we have in Campania Pompeii on one side and Pestum on the other side. Pompeii is the Latin you know, witness of uh, the importance and relevance of wine culture 2000 years ago, and Pestum is uh, the place where we have the Greek temples. So the, uh, I mean, uh, the history of the colonization of the Greeks in Southern uh, Italy, with the Magna Grecia economic colonization. We've got grapes coming from Latin roots and grapes coming from the Greek roots. So we have right. the Greco and Alianico grapes coming from Greece. And we have, of course, uh, the Tiano or uh, the Falangina or the Piedi also coming from the Latin origin. So we got both in the area. And the family has always been here um, to preserve this heritage of the ancient uh, viticulture. The, the family established the, uh, the winery at the beginning of 1700, so three centuries ago. And so it's, I am now representing the 10th generation of Master Berardino in the wine business. All right, so I mean, there's, you know, that's, that's quite a history. I mean, we don't have people who, you know, my family has been in the United States for a long time, but 10 generations is, is quite, a, quite an accomplishment to be in one area. So as you said, uh, ancient roots going back to both the initial Greek settlements and then slightly more recent with the Roman times, uh, you know, Campania itself was, I think it means countryside or the Romans looked at it as like a, as a yeah. fertile countryside and then and really as a both a vacation land and a supplier of a lot of agricultural products including wine correct yeah it was it was called campania felix by the romans right. the felix meaning fertile because of the presence of the volcano the mount vesuvio that with the eruptions of course uh, was able to destroy but uh, it gave fertility with the ashes to all the area so we got uh, a, a you know a huge presence of agriculture in all the region but uh, what is really uh, unusual in the region is the fact that we have two different uh, uh, styles of viticulture. One is from the coast and the other is from the inland. From the coast, we have got, of course, the Vesuvio slopes that are closer to the sea. So we've got uh, a milder um, environment and climate. So we've got uh, grape varietals that are uh, usually dedicated to produce uh, uh, milder and softer wines uh, with a little less acidity and uh, with a lower altitude, of course, uh, mm -hmm. less excursion of temperature between night and day. If you move in the inland, just uh, 35, 40 minutes drive, you have a completely different environment. You go up to the mountains, uh, you've got snow every year in the vineyard. Uh, still here, in, today, we still have some snow around. We've got high mountains all around and, uh, and uh, the, the vegetation is uh, dark green and um, uh, viticulture goes up to 700 meters from the sea level and uh, the grape varietals are different the period of maturation is different so it's two different worlds completely. yeah I, I don't think people really i mean you're, you're south of rome people typically i think think of southern italy as a very warm region i mean when we talk about you know most of the wines and the wine regions from from southern italy we always talk about the heat and the temperatures and and you know these robust grape varieties that 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 thrive in the heat but you guys are actually in a region where even in, in March now, you have you have snow still in the, in the area because you're so far up into the hills, but not really that far from the coast. So so pretty interesting. So talk a little bit about about your estate. Your estate actually um, just backtrack on the history a little bit. Um, it's been in the family for a long time, but kind of more in the modern era. You know, uh, Antonio, uh, Antonio, I think was your father, correct? And he he yeah. really kind of brought the winery out of the World War II era and into you know, the, the second half of, of the 20th century. So talk yes, about yes. Um, Antonio, uh, my father, um, was a very hard-headed man. He, he was really a mountain guy. And uh, he had the heritage of his uh, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, 
uh, who were extremely successful in bringing uh, the Mastro Berardino wines in all the continents, all over the world. Starting in the second half of 1800s, we have the opening of foreign markets. In 1878, we opened North American markets and European markets. And uh, uh, going into 1900s, uh, we have uh, a coverage of, uh, all of African markets, Asian markets, uh, Australia, and so on. So the family was really uh, kind of a pioneer. Uh, we got bottles uh, going back to the 20s, so about one century ago. This is a bottle of Taurasi from 1928, wow. just to give you an idea. But uh, I mean, uh, here, here, we have a, here we have a 34. So we got a, a library of about uh, at least one century of uh, uh, vintages of our wines here that uh, uh, are, you know, the, the witness just the, the, the attention to quality that we had in the past uh, generations. So my father with the war had to struggle, had to fight, to rebuild. I mean, to start replanting some vineyards in the area that were destroyed during the war. And so um, he wrote a letter in 1943, uh, at the end of September, just after the bombing from the Allied army, and uh, he said, we stayed uh, two days, two full days uh, in our uh, uh, refugee in the cellars. They built uh, a refugee inside the, the cellar, in some grottas. And after that, he said, in, we went out and we made our harvest. Wow. <laughs> right after the bomb. This is just to give you the idea of the determination, the motivation of the family to remain linked to the heritage. So my father, after World War II, was really, you know, uh, a guy that, wanted uh, you know to to go back to the success of his father and his great his grandfather and so he started uh, reopening the markets starting again from uk from london and then from there canada and north america and uh, it was uh, um, i mean hard for him but uh, in the late 50s at the beginning of the 60s he started having again a big success with the, the famous uh, this is one of the legends for us, the 1968 Taurasi Reserva. Yeah, wow. This is That's probably wild. one of the, you know, the bottles for the big collectors. Right. So he was able to reestablish the brand reputation uh, worldwide. So he, he was really uh, the man who, you know, gave to the story of the family a turn around about, you know, a situation that was really hard. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, my experience with, with Master Berardino is that, you know, there's kind of two avenues of wines. There's sort of the La Crema wines, which La Crema, La Crema Christi was always sort of a famous and popular wine, especially around some holidays um, and always would sell. And but then you had the, you know, the 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 authentic or premier wines from the region, which was including the Tarazzi and, and Greco and Fiano, which were a little less known. And, and even today, still maybe a little bit less known, but you're 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 definitely a leader. I think it, today, your production in Campania, you, you don't account for quite as much of a percentage of the overall production of Campania as you used to, but you still account for a fair amount of the of the DOC and DOCG wines that come from Campania, don't you? Yes, we have, uh, because uh, we had uh, a period in which we made a very strong investment in our area. So we have now 260 hectares of properties during the decades. And so this means uh, 15 estates. 15. And uh, wow. yeah, through these uh, 15 estates, uh, we have the possibility to do uh, a work of research in the area on different microenvironments uh, with our typical grapes uh, in the different appellation areas. So this is uh, extremely important to have a representation of what happens in the area uh, for Gregory II for DOCG, Fiano di Avellino DOCG, Taurasi DOCG, and for the other wines that come after this, this three big pillars of uh, Campania viticulture. So the investment in viticulture for us is strategic. Right, and you guys have a very strong, going back to your history a little bit, you have a very strong tie to those grapes in the region. Um, and, and so Antonio made the decision or somebody along the way, I'm assuming it's Antonio made the decision really to not kind of steer off the path and use more sort of Western or common soluble grapes, to stick with those classic grapes. And I think it's paid off for you folks. Um, how do you see your place with these grapes today? How do they compete in markets like the United States, for instance, against what a lot of people might find easier to, to buy or shop for sort of, you know, 
the, the more French bridles or Western bridles that we're, we're commonly associated with. How do, how do you fit in that, that market segment? How do you see that working? There's a kind of cycle, you know, there are periods in which uh, people look for, you know, easier wines and there, there are periods in which, uh, you know, people look for more, you know, being more and more experienced and so they look for distinctive varieties. This is a period in which uh, people are looking for some distinction, uh, you know, they, they don't want just to have uh, uh, homogeneous taste, they want to understand more what is the linkage between a variety and a territory. And uh, I think this is something that is really becoming more and more fascinating. And people are studying more and more about wine and viticulture, not just the wine tasting techniques, but they want to understand what, what is behind a bottle. Behind a bottle, usually there's man and land together. You cannot you know, separate land and man because land, of course, means nature, the contribution of nature. And man means the contribution of creativity and sensibility, soul. So a wine is usually the result of the junction of these two elements. And I think this is what really makes our business different from any other business. Right. I, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think that, that today, especially with social media and everybody's attention to finding something that's, that's unique or different, having, having those grape varieties and having your, your, your land and your region, those 15 estates, um, being something that's that's not common actually is is definitely a, a, a really nice thing. So um, I definitely appreciate it. And I know, you know, when I serve the wines that the people, you know, they don't know what to expect almost sometimes because they've never maybe had to rouse or, or record with you both. So it's it's really interesting to serve yeah, these but, wines to people. But what is happening in, you know, you see that you always look at a kind of a evolution of the taste yeah. of the consumer. So as as more people are in different tasting occasions, as more they experience different lands and different grape varietals, this really makes a difference because uh, the taste evolves and they usually look for you know, more elegance, more finesse, maybe higher acidity because this means uh, you know, a vibrant wine with, with a, a character, with a personality. Usually they start uh, understanding what is the, different from, the difference from uh, between a mountain wine and a wine from a playing territory, you know, that really is a huge difference in the style and in the character of a wine. And, you know, starting from these, they then go to the next step, that is the curiosity of understanding what is behind the bottle. And the third step is wine tourism. They start traveling, you know, in wine tourism destinations. And this is, you know, the 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 final step right. to get experienced people that look for very good wines but with a story behind. Well, we'll speak a little bit about wine and tourism. You guys have been integral in in working with the um, the region, the, you know, the the recovery and the and the archaeology around Pompeii, and you've actually created some wines that uh, and, and vineyards that create wines that maybe are. As close, I think, as as possible to what might have been served in ancient Roman times when Vesuvio was uh, before it erupted. Uh, yes, uh, we we started this project. Uh, the idea was from my father Antonio 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. But uh, the project started in 1994, and uh, the first uh, uh, vintage was produced in 2001. The wine is Villa dei Misteri. It's a blend of Arianico, Piedirosso, and Shashinoso, three ancient grapes of the region. Arianico is Greek, Piedirosso and Shashinoso are Latin, and uh, the, the Ministry of Culture of uh, the Italian government asked us to uh, rebuild the, the botanic environment inside the archaeological town of Pompeii. That was mainly focused on uh, vines and wine. So we had the, the possibility to replant in the same position of the past of 2000 years ago of the 79 AD year of the eruption of Mount Vesuvio we were able to re identify the position of each vine and to each replant vine. Wow. yeah each vine and to replant each vine in the same position so we have the same density of implantation with the same training system with the descendants of those grapes and uh, we were able to plant 15 small vineyards in these gardens of the houses so the uh, i mean we have the uh, the vineyard of alianico 
with the bush training system planted in the garden of the Orto dei Fujaschi, that is one of the most famous and visited parts of uh, Pompeii archaeological site. So, and, and so on, the Foro Boario, the Nave Europa, all these gardens are uh, now, in these last 25 years, uh, you know, have, uh, have, have been uh, populated by our vines. So, so what have you, with these, you say gardens and houses, would these have actually been people's houses and the gardens attached to their houses? So how big are these plots? How big uh, are these they gardens? Are, they are very, very small. Uh, yeah. On the whole, 15 vineyards make uh, 1.5 hectares. So oh, they okay. are very small. So, so one, an, was... a hectare is 2.42 acres. So you're talking about, yeah. you know, th three acres or something like that total amongst 15 different plots. So. Yeah, so they would have been truly like wines that would have been made for people's personal consumption, really, I guess, at the time. No, no, no. This was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they were uh, people who used to uh, sell wine, sell wine. In, the, in, the uh, in, the, uh, in the wine shops. And, uh, you know, the, we have on the on the streets, uh, when, when you when you go to Via dell'Abbondanza in Pompeii, you know, uh, you have several wine bars. Right. And uh, those were the places where they they used to sell the wines that were produced inside the town. Of yeah, because I think I remember reading in the in the archaeology of Pompeii they found you know in in ancient times anyways, but they they found a lot of wine bars. It was kind of a common thing, like it is today almost. You know, people like to drink. How, exactly. how different? Not too much different than uh, than two thousand years ago. So that's pretty interesting. All right, so so that's that's really uh, that's really cool. So you you have with Master Veragino your your proper wine your your winery regular. You know, you've got uh a, a true connection in the in the sort of modern sense to all these grapes but you also have this this connection to the ancient world or you know two thousand years ago and and you brought that all together that's really really great so um what what can we look forward to from from master Berardino going forward is there anything that's different or are you just trying to really kind of pay attention to the wines that you have currently oh, with these we do a lot of research, uh, we do a lot of innovation, and we got uh, several uh, new things that are coming out in the last uh, years in, in terms of uh, experiments. Uh, we have a very funny, very funny, very successful, uh, you know, this, is, this has become, become a, a kind of a marketing case for us. This is an Aglianico in white, uh, so a Blanc de Noir made from Aglianico, and it's called Nero a Metà. This is one of the experiments that we launched uh, some years ago and is having a big success. We are having uh, some uh, new experiments dedicated to uh, so, our so just wine. to just to go back to that wine for a second. So you're pressing Alianico and then just taking the juice, no no yeah, obviously skin zero contact. skin contact as well. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and does it see and what kind of um, so and then you ferment it, does it see any kind of barrel aging or is it stainless steel? What's no, no barrel aging. Oh, just no good at all. Just no clean and fresh. And what is the characteristic is the color because Aglianico doesn't have the color of a you know a, a white grape, so you have this very gray, uh, unusual. It, it seems like a diamond reflection when you look at okay. the, the glass. Very very nice. And we also have a very important experiment called the Stilema, and uh, in the in the project uh, named the Stilema, we are producing three wines: Fiano di Avellino, Greco di Tufo, and the Taurasi that are going back to the style of production of my father in the 60s and 70s. So if you compare this uh, with uh, our flagship wine, that is Radici, yep. Radici Taurasi, here you have a, a higher concentration uh, with a longer period of maceration. In this case, you have much more freshness, agility, and more transparency. So the style, a different style of a Taurasi, this is a way to give the idea of people of the variety of expression of a territory. So we do experiments on our grapes, on our territory, but we do so many uh, different, uh, you know, trajectories of uh, development, of innovation that uh, are really, you know, fascinating and also uh, motivating for me. Excellent. All right. So the last thing I like to talk about, because I do, um, I do work in the restaurant business and we, we often, almost always, are serving wines with food, you know, with the three kind of classic, the, the Fiano d'Avellino, Greco di Tufo and the Tarazi, what, what, just quickly, what, what kind of foods do you recommend or do you prefer with each of those wines? What do you think works best with those cuisine for, from a cuisine point of view? Okay, Fiano di Avellino is, uh, is uh, the most elegant white wine that we have in, uh, in the region yep. with a beautiful finesse. Uh, it's a wine that is dedicated to long aging. 
So you can drink it uh, when it's young and you will have uh, freshness, the fruit and so on. But uh, if you are able to wait uh, some years, it will give you a beautiful expression of uh, you know, maturity. So this is a wine that we propose usually as an aperitif or with the uh, delicate courses of white fishes. Uh, this is very good for, for, you know, for clean, clean courses. Uh, if you compare this uh, with uh, his twin, Greco di Tufo, Greco di Tufo you know, has a completely different character because Greco di Tufo is more similar to a red wine in terms of body and structure. So uh, in the mouth, uh, you have uh, you know, a wider, wider uh, uh, character. In this case, uh, we propose uh, you know, the fried seafood that is very mm -hmm. typical of, of the area. Then we propose it uh, even with the, our uh, uh, pasta courses, because mm -hmm. this matches very well. But you can, uh, with Greco di Dufo, you can go up to uh, you know, white meat courses as well. And even with some cheeses when it's aged, even for Greco, you know, you have the same approach of Fiano. These are wines that can be aged. These whites you know, are beautiful even after 20 or 25 or 30 years of aging. And uh, when you go to a Taurasi, both the Radici Taurasi, the black label, that is a little younger version, and the Reserva of Taurasi that is a little more aged, in this case, uh, if uh, Taurasi is a little younger, usually you can go from, uh, you know, um, a brasato, mm -hmm. so meat courses with yep. a little more complexity. When Aglianico is younger than a Taurasi, you can go even to easier courses like a Tibon Steak. But in this case, uh, a brasato is perfect. Mm -hmm. If you go to the Reserva, usually uh, it's nice to match it uh, with uh, with uh, maybe game courses okay. or with the aged cheeses. That is beautiful with the aged cheeses. So just real quick on the on the reserve, the Tarazi and the Reserva, um, those are obviously part of your winemaking process. Those wines are being aged after they're fermented in presumably some type of wood. Oh, can yeah, you definitely. describe that real quickly? Okay, we use for uh, for all our Taurasi, we use about 60% of the big uh, casks of Slavonian oak, for 48 hectoliters big, and uh, a 40% then goes through used barrels, second passage barrels. All so right. this is usually the approach because we don't want to uh, use uh, too much wood contribution on these wines. You want the you want the fruit to kind of maintain and, and shine through. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, all right. Uh, Piero Messer Berardino connecting the Hellenic and the Latin world with grapes and the ancient and the modern world. I, I, I really appreciate it. 10th Ten, generation winemaker and family in, in uh, Campania and Italy. And hopefully we'll, we'll see many more wines and generations to come. So thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you so much. I, I hope to come there and, uh, you know, have an event with you in, in presence as soon as possible. Well, we're, we're waiting for you. So it, Hopefully we'll be soon. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.